Hello there, and welcome to another Contacts with Conway. Um, in this edition, I'm in conversation with Dr. Greg Denaire uh, from Ohio in the United States. Greg's practice deals mainly with complex uh, cases, and I began the conversation uh, by asking him when he first uh, got interested in fitting scleral lenses. We joined the conversation at that point. If you would prefer to watch this video with English or Spanish subtitles, Please go to the cog in the bottom right hand corner of the screen and press to select your preferred options. Well, I, I work in an anterior ophthalmology practice and currently we have three cornea specialists, but I, I started back actually with my first scleral lens fitting back in 2001. And what had happened was I was using corneal GP lenses for patients who had keratoconus or corneal transplants, you know, some sort of irregularity. And I, I was also in, inexperienced at that time, but what I was finding is that I was just spending an inordinate amount of time trying to get these small, relatively small corneal GP lenses to center on the eye. Mm. I might go through four or five, six lenses and still may not even find success at that stage. And a colleague of mine at the Ohio State University College of Optometry actually recommended that I try what, what I had hardly even ever heard of before was these scleral contact lenses. And of course, back in 2001, there was just very few practitioners even around the world that were right. utilizing these devices. And so I ordered a, a fitting set, a diagnostic set from CNH Contacts out of Texas. And that lens actually was the predecessor to the lens that you started with, which was the SoClear. And that lens, if I re recall correctly, was about 13 and a half millimeters yeah. in diameter or so. But at the, t in the t at the time when I got the fitting set, it looked ginormous. <laughs> and I'll still, I'll still always remember the time when I, when I first put a, a scleral lens on a patient's eye without any education on the fitting process at all when I put the lens on the eye, it's centered. And at that stage, I, I, I remember thinking this, you know, this is where I want to go because there's a, these lenses have a lot of potential for the patient population that I was trying to serve. Yeah. I remember I, I when I, again, with that product, I, I was sent on a, um, um, sort of an exercise down in the middle East, um, trial by fire really. Um, uh, to demonstrate the fitting with very little experience behind me. I was launched into a, a hospital in Jordan with uh, probably 20 or 30 patients waiting for the first day. They had a team of nurses to assist and things like that, but I got more experience in those two days of fitting that we went through this hospital than I'd had in the preceding 18 months, I think. Um, but then, I mean, so that's, mine was 10 or 12 years, but it's absolutely exploded since then. Um, so, you know, we're all aware now, but of course the big, the big um, thing that you've been involved in is scleral shape. Um, you know, the, what actually goes on beyond the, the, the normal range of uh, the, the, the topographer. Well, I, I would, you know, been fitting scleral lenses for some years uh, using diagnostic lenses like everybody else. And I, I've, I've, I realized at some stage that there had to be more to the fitting process than these diagnostic lenses. I mean, in fact, when you really think about it, it's, it, it's a bit, uh, it, it, fitting with diagnostic lenses is certainly more art than science. Yeah. And uh, it, the learning curve, especially even for the novice practitioner can be very steep. And much of that stems because uh, up until recently, we haven't been able to measure the, the anterior ocular surface beyond the cornea. So we've had our traditional topo corneal topographers which do a nice job of, of corneal measurement, but we know from experience and from and from literature that they are they're virtually use, useless for scleral lens fitting, and so we uh, myself and a few other engineers and another lab in the U.S. ended up forming a company called Precision Ocular Metrology, and our mission really was to create 
an instrument, a profilometer, that uh, we would now term as a corneal scleral topographer. So th this is an instrument that is able to not only measure the cornea, but out onto the bulbar conjunctival scleral surface. What year would this be? When, when did this um, start? That, we, started, we started really about 2015. With, with That's the quite recent then. Yeah, so, and, uh, and now we've you know, obviously progressed uh, quite quickly down into the year 2020. And what was the technology that you had to draw on there? Because it's quite a different technology than is used in the traditional Placido disc um, reflection technology um, that's used in a conventional topographer. Right. So the, the Placido disc, of course, is confined to the cornea and it's, it can't reflect off of or reach out to the bulbar conjunctival scleral surface. What we did with the SMAP 3D is we created hardware an instrument that has two cameras and one central projector. And what that arrangement allows is for the instrument to take a series of triangulated measurements. And then it's able to use something that's actually not new, it's been used uh, for a while now, it's called structured light. Yeah, when, kind of, I, when I first heard of this, it's really very much like uh, the sort of uh, uh, technology used in 3D printing, you know, um, scanning an image, isn't it? It, it? Well, in fact, what structured light is able to do for us is the software can create a three-dimensional model of the ocular surface. And we can use that model to basically measure sagittal height of the eye, anywhere on the eye we want. And we can use that both just for general measurement but as we'll get into during the course of this conversation is what's important for us is scleral lens design. So the, as far as the practitioner is concerned, he uses the instrument, it looks a bit space age, a bit, you know, um, um, compared with a conventional topographer, certainly more than a, a traditional, even more traditional keratometer. Um, he would actually instill fluorescein into the eye, which is different to what you, we, we have to do with a, with a topographer. And that's because the, um, the light used is uh, on the blue end of the spectrum. So you get some, get some fluorescence is, uh, and it's done in almost complete darkness, I take. You, you tune the, the, um, the, the lights down in the test room to uh, as dark as you can, I take it. Well, it, it, it's more helpful actually as you're taking the test to have the lights dim, but it, it actually doesn't require you necessarily to have complete right. dark. But you're, you're correct in that the reason that we have to have the fluorescein is because of the way it measures the surface, it will not recognize the clear tissue of the cornea or the bulbar conjunctiva of the surface that you're, that you're measuring out onto the sclera. It would be invisible to the instrument. So that's, the fluorescein has to cover that surface for it to be able to register data. Oh, to make it more visible, in other words. Yes. Yeah, um, Correct. I see. Yeah. And uh, so then the instrument then produces a, a, a dimension, a height map for the whole area scan. You have to retract the lids, I take it, to get under the, uh, uh, and, and, and see that surface, top and bottom. That's correct. And in, in fact, actually, with the SMAP 3D in particular, what we do or what the practitioner will do when they do an examination is they'll take three separate measurements. So there's the first measurement, which is the straight gaze and the clinician as, and they usually actually have the help, the patient help out a bit. They'll retract the eyelids as far as possible and they'll take a straight gaze measurement. And then we also take two more measurements, one where the patient looks down and then one, another one where the patient is looking up. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we do that with the SMAP 3D is because what we found is that on many eyes, even if you're retracting the lids as far back as possible, because of anatomical differences with patients, including you know, relatively small apertures or deep sockets, that you can oftentimes miss important data underneath the, the, in the, the superior lid, in the superior quadrant. Mm -hmm. And in fact, actually we published a study a few years ago in eye and contact lens that showed that for the straight gaze only measurement, 68% of eyes will have less than 50% of the coverage 
needed to fit a 16 millimeter square lens. So having had that data, then you upload that and turn it into a digital image of the eye. Um, how does that then help you with lens design? Can it, will it translate directly or uh, is, is it then fed into a, um, um, a CNC lathe? How does that work? There is software available to the practitioner to basically use the data in the image sets to create their own customized version of a scleral contact lens. So the, the, the software actually gives the practitioner a starting point. It basically will fit the best design scleral contact lens to the eye, but then the practitioner can manipulate the, in, in sort of real time the different parameters of the lens to customize it as he or she sees fit. The other route actually, which is more recent and new, is that they have the ability to do a completely free-formed, customized lens that they call the latitude square lens. Yeah. Is it linked to specifically to one laboratory at the moment, or are you using other, uh, can the practitioner use other lens designs as well? Well, currently, as far as the automotive type of process that you might use to design a, a scleral lens, either the Europa or the Latitude lens, that is linked directly to visionary optics. But a practitioner can own the SMAP 3D topographer and utilize the data to fit other types of lens design. So, you know, they, they can use the instrument to measure, for example, the amount of scleral tericity that might, that might be apparent for the patient or irregularity of the square and that type of thing. And they can use that data when they're, when they're fitting other types of designs. Thank you for watching the first half of this conversation with Dr. Greg Denea. If you've enjoyed it so far, please join us for the second half of the conversation where Greg will be sharing some clinical experiences with the new technology. If you've enjoyed the video so far, Please remember to give us a like, share it with friends, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.